You can be seated, amen? Amen, thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Well, we all sound like y'all hungry for the word, so let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. When you get there, say, thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> hey, man, I want to shout out a big thank you to Angel Gonzalez and Francis Bush and all the team that painted the church. And uh, thank you, guys. And I uh, worked yesterday to put the stone on the foundation. Really appreciate that, guys. Amen. 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 Philippians 2, let's look at verse number 5. Philippians 2, verse 5. It says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of, of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name. Somebody say a name. a name. Which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Father God, I just uh, thank you uh, this morning for the awesome opportunity to minister your word to your people. And Father God, I ask right now that you would give me words of wisdom, words of knowledge, words of understanding, Father God. Utterance to open my mouth boldly and speak as you would want me to speak. Father God, I pray this morning that your people will hear your voice in my voice. Father God, let the body be edified, built up, strengthened, refreshed, revived in the inner man like never before. Father, use this word this morning to speak into people's lives, speak into their situations, Father God. Father God, you know what your people need, and Father God, I pray, pray that you would grant what they need, Father. Father, I thank you for what you're going to do in advance, in Jesus' name. If you believe it, say amen. I want to minister this morning on don't let anything define you but God. Don't let anything define you but God. God gave Jesus the name that is above every name because God did not want anything other, other than him to define who his son was. You know, as I, as I minister and I begin to minister, I want you guys to know that when I minister, I'm ministering from a place of maybe something I went through, um, uh, experiences. It's not um, something that I got from a book of, off of video. The things that I minister to is things that I've had to walk through in my own personal life. And then through that, God gives me revelation and understanding to, uh, to um, navigate me through those things that I go through. God told me a long time ago, Tony, there's nothing that I will allow to come into your life that I would not use as a platform for ministry. That, listen, you can be assured that even, listen, a negative situation that comes into your life, when I get you out of it, I will make a platform for you to be able to minister deliverance to those that are in similar situations and circumstances so they'll know how to get out of it and they'll know what's going on in their lives. So as I begin to minister, I'm ministering from a place of something that I had to walk through in my own life. You know, many have lived under, the, of, of, of under other people's definitions of them. I've had to live under people's definitions of me. Well, this morning, by the time the service is over, if you receive the word that I'm going to minister, you will be truly set free of the opinions of others. Let me say that again. 
If you receive this word this morning, you will truly be set free from the opinions of others and what other people think about you. Sometimes we think deliverance and healing is just for the addicted and the sick. But sometimes we need deliverance and healing in our souls. We are saved, but our souls have been wounded. In Psalms 23, the Bible says that, G, that the Lord restores my soul. David said the Lord will restore your soul. We are saved, but our souls have been wounded through the things that we have gone through in life. The wound was caused by abuse. It was caused by insensitive people. If you tear things down, you are an abuser. If you tear people down, you're an abuser. If you don't build people up, listen, you're not doing the will of God. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.20, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. That whatever you're saying about anybody, well, whether in front of them or not in front of them, that it's ministering grace to those people. Even what you think about people, that it's ministering grace even in your heart, in your mind. Even though you understand that people have issues, you still see them through the eyes of Almighty God. N listen, not forgetting that God, that you used to be in a mess and God delivered you and set you free and cleaned you up. So don't get impatient when people are in the same process that you're walking through. Sometimes we are the victims of other people's words. Even though it may have happened years ago, you are still carrying around the wounds of those words. It could be what a parent said. It could be what an ex or current spouse said. It could be what a school teacher said or even a boss. One of the most damaging things you can do to yourself is to believe a lie about yourself. Let me say that again. One of the most damaging things you can do to yourself is to believe a lie about yourself. Listen, sometimes we've been bombarded with so much negativity, we subconsciously accept that is that is what that's, that must be true. Well, I come to tell you the devil is a liar. If anybody says something negative about you or put a label on you, that is a lie from the pits of hell. That is not God's definition of you. You are a person of value. Jesus was sent to redeem you because stuff on earth was not enough to buy you back. Gold was not enough. Silver was not enough. Every, all the gold in Fort Knox was not enough. God had to come from heaven and come down here and shed his blood to redeem you, to buy you back. You are somebody of value. Don't let anybody tell you that you are not valuable. A lot of times... People are saying your value based on your actions. Maybe you may have done it, but it does not still define who you are. Yeah, I did it, but my God, I'm more than my actions. You're not what they said about you. You may have did it, but it does not define you. It doesn't devalue you. Someone else's opinion about you is not the deal. The only opinion that matters and is 100% accurate is the Lord's. People's opinions change about you all the time. <laughs> you know, the same people that said, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, were the same ones a couple of chapters later that said, crucify him. So you can't base your self-worth on the, the shallowness of men. You have to base your value on what God said about you because God's opinion about you never shifts. It's a solid foundation. It's never going to shift. I don't care if you go out tonight and blow it. It's not going to change God's opinion about you. It'll change everybody in this room's opinion about you, but it won't change God's opinion about you. So stop basing your life on other 
people's opinion and get established and rooted and grounded in what God said about you and what God thinks about you. That's it, period. Drop the rest. Drop it like a bad habit. Go to Matthew 16. I went through this. I was concerned about what people thought about me, how they felt about me, and God had to deliver me from that. Go to Matthew 16, verse 13. Matthew 16, verse 13. Verse 13 says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say I, the son of man, am? And they say, some say that there are John the Baptist, some Elias, other Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Jesus asks his disciples a question. Who do men say that I am? Some say this, some say that. Everybody has an opinion about who Jesus was. All their, notice something though, all their opinions was less than what God said about Jesus. The one that sent the prophets, you're saying is a prophet. The one that sent Elijah, you're saying is Elijah. The one that sent Jeremiah, you said is Jeremiah. And Peter got the revelation from heaven. He got God's opinion about who Jesus was. He said, you are the son of the living God. Jesus said, you are right. That's it. Bingo. You got it. So listen, the only opinion that matters is the opinion from heaven, what God says. Some people will probably say 50 things about me. What do you think about that guy, Tony Samuel? He says he's that, he's that, oh, probably all different. But listen, it don't matter. It's what God said about Tony Samuels that matters. Period. <laughs> Ain't that free not to be tied up on what people think about you? I'm free to be myself. That's why I say leave people alone in praise and worship. Some people can be free to jump around. Some people can be free to sit in their, in their seat. Just leave them alone and let them be free. Just because they don't look like you, let them be. You be free to be you and let them free to be themselves. Lighthouse Freedom Center, not Lighthouse, not lighthouse Manipulation Center. It's freedom for real. I'm free just to sit here. I'm free to jump around. You're free to do whatever you want to do. As long as it lines up with the will of God. Let me throw that in. <laughs> Anything? <laughs> if I got to force you, it's not freedom. If I got to spank you into it, it's not freedom. Give, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Be true to yourself. Don't try to be someone else's opinion about you. Don't be a spiritual chameleon. You ever see a chameleon? He changes based on what's going on around him, what predator is coming around. He's able to change and simulate into his surroundings. And God said, I don't want you to be a spiritual chameleon. I want you to be yourself.
Look at your neighbor and say, God knows you anyways. I would rather be myself than a cheap carbon copy of somebody else. I'm not trying to be like T.D. Jakes, Creflo Dollar. I'm Tony Samuels. God bless them. I celebrate their gift, but they do their deal. I'm doing my deal. My favorite preacher is me. I ain't celebrating somebody else's uniqueness and denying my uniqueness and what God is doing in my life and in my spirit. It's not pride. It's confidence in your identity. It's confidence in who you are. It's freedom, for real. Celebrate your uniqueness. Celebrate your uniqueness. You're only one of a kind. When God made you, he threw away the mold. He didn't want a bunch of duplicates. He didn't want copies. You ever put a copy on a copier or send a print job? Spit me out 100 of these. God said, I only want one of you, and I'm throwing away the mold. So be yourself. <laughs> Glory. Freedom. I'm minister of freedom this morning. Oh. Begin to like yourself. Begin to love yourself. Not in love with yourself, but love yourself. The Bible says love others as you love yourself. How are you going to love others if you don't love yourself? You got to look in the mirror and celebrate. And listen, if you can't look in the mirror and see something that you can rejoice about, you're under the lie of the enemy. You're believing the lie of the enemy, and you're basing your value on what you did, not who God created you to be. <laughs> Somebody, man, I guess it's better than getting cut through the roof. Let's go to Genesis 32. Genesis 32. You got to change who you are to be accepted by anybody, any clique, any club, any group, evacuate. They're not the ones. If you got to become something else to be accepted by a group, a person, and you can't be yourself, you got to, after you're with them, you go home and feel like you got to take off a mask or some suit, evacuate that. That's not God. Genesis 32, let's look at verse 24. In verse 24 it says, and Jacob was left alone. I, I got, I got, uh, I froze on that, 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 that little one, two, three, four, five words in my study time. And Jacob was left alone. You know, sometimes you got to be alone to find yourself. Let me say that again. Sometimes you got to be alone to find yourself. Sometimes we are involved in so many other things, doing everything for everyone else, and sometimes you lose yourself. Sometimes we're doing so much with the kids. Sometimes we're doing so much in church. Sometimes we're doing so much for our spouses. Sometimes we're doing so much for this one and that one. We lose ourselves. And sometimes you got to get back alone and find yourself again. Find your purpose again. Listen, you can't be given out to everybody else and neglect yourself. 
Let me say that again. You can't be giving out to everybody else and then neglect yourself. You got to take care of yourself. You got to find out the reason why you do what you're doing. You got to find out your identity and you can't lose yourself helping other people get fulfill their dreams, their visions, and their goals at the risk of losing yourself. What do you like to do? What do you want to do? Where would you want to go on vacation? Where would you want to go to eat? And sometimes we got to find ourselves. Sometimes we're, I haven't even thought about that. That means you have not thought about yourself. You've lost yourself. It's not being selfish. It's not being, being um, no, no, it's, 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 it's having a, a balance. The Bible says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. And if you're looking for over everybody else and neglecting yourself, it's a false balance. Paul said, I guard myself and watch over myself lest I preach to others and I be a castaway. Paul said, I can't be preaching to everybody else and neglect myself and then I get shipwrecked and knocked off and fall back because I neglected the necessity, the sustaining power of the things that I need to fulfill my life. And Jacob was left alone. Sometimes it's not, I know the Bible says it's not good for man to be alone. But listen, sometimes you need to be alone to find yourself, to hear your own heart, to hear your own desires. Sometimes we're hearing so much stuff from the outside, it drowns out our desires on the inside and we lose ourselves. Look at your neighbor and tell them, don't overextend yourself. You can't make it to everything. You can't be everything to everybody. You are not Jesus. And don't let people make you feel bad about it. But listen, I am only one person. I can't spread myself thin over all this stuff. I got to find one or two things and be good at it than spreading myself over 50 things and be ineffective. And some of us need to find ourselves again because we've lost ourselves in caring for everybody else. Even not bad things, even children. My God, these kids got some crazy schedules. School, sports. He actually had three games in one week. I'm like, who made this schedule? This is obviously somebody without a life. <laughs> they don't want to do nothing else than stay up in some school. <laughs> yeah, and he's got two games and. I'm like, man, mommy's over here. I'm over here splitting the family up, man. I'm like, man. You know, I'm all for that stuff, but who, what the kids going to remember? They're going to remember what we did as a family. Remember all that school stuff? What did we do as a family? The other extreme is some people spend too much time with themselves. And that's dangerous because men were created for relationships. Whatever the case, find the balance. Jacob wrestled with God. Say he wrestled. <laughs> Sounds like a mismatch. Wrestling with God, are you serious? Man, 
what, what verse was that? Oh, here it is. Okay. Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let you go except you bless me. You better not let go till you get that blessing. He said unto him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince has thou power with God and with men thou hast prevailed. Jacob wrestled with God. He wanted something from God. I believe that Jacob was tired of living under his name Jacob, which meant trickster. I don't even think he realized he was in the middle of an identity crisis. When you get tired of living under other people's opinions and definitions of you, you will begin to fight against that old definition, that old label. And when someone from your past comes to remind you of that definition, you will say, you got the wrong guy. I'm not that guy. But you were, nope, I'm not the guy. Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. What's amazing about this is the Lord asked him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And the Lord said, no more shall your name be called Jacob. And God is saying that this morning. No more shall your name be called what them people are saying about you. No more will you live under the label that men have put on you. No more will you live under the label that your behavior put on you. No more will you live under the label that your parents put on you or a teacher or an ex-spouse. No more. It ends this morning. No more. That's not your name. Look at your name and say, that's not my name no more. I got a new name. No more shall your name be called Jacob. It shall be Israel because you are a what? You're not a trickster. You're a prince. You're not a conniver. You're a prince. You're not an addict. You're a king. You're a queen. You're not a convict. You're not a felon. You're a prince. You're a king. Well, Pastor Tone is on my record. The record has already been written in heaven. The blood of Jesus. All heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will not pass away. I don't care what is written on planet earth. As far as heaven concerned, you all have a new name. What name is the enemy trying to put on you? Change your name. Change what you say about yourself. You know, people can talk about you, but as long as you don't say you're all right. The Bible says thou art snared by the words of your mouth. I can't stop people from talking about me, but I can control what I say about myself. Make a commitment. I'm not saying nothing negative about myself. You are the head and not the tail. You are above, never again beneath. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I got 66 books of names for you. Take your pick. Use them all. Because you are a prince and you have power with God and man. 
God blessed him by changing his name. Why is that? Because you will not walk in the fullness of God until you change your name. You will not walk in the fullness of God by walking by what other people say about you. The only way you're going to walk in what God has for you is in his identity for your life. Not the identity of your past, not the identity of people, only the identity of Jesus Christ. What he said about you. Why am I Pastor Tony? Not because a man said it, a man recognized it. But Jesus said it from heaven into my spirit. And so he said, this is what I put you on this planet for. And it was confirmed by men, but it came from Jesus. So there's no, it's different if somebody says it and you never heard it from heaven. Then you'll battle with it. But you, if you heard from heaven, you don't have to confer with flesh and blood ever again. It's done. God blessed them by changing his name. You see, God calls you righteous. But it's not just a name, it's identity. Because it says you have been made the righteous of God. It's just not a name, it's transformation. When God changes your name, he transforms you into the person of that name. So it's not just a name without the goods to back it up. God gives who he calls, he equips, gives the equipment to walk it out. So if he names, it, names you that, you got the equipment to be that. <laughs> In 1 Samuel 10, 6, the Bible says, on about Saul, King Saul, and the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will be transformed into another man. You see, when God's spirit comes upon you, you are transformed into another man. I'm not the same guy I used to be. I've been transformed by the spirit of God. The old Tony Sands would never get up here and be speaking like this. I'll be in the back with Elliot in him. I felt comfortable. God said, nope, right here. But when the spirit of the Lord comes upon a man, he's transformed into another man. So God is not just in the business of changing your name. He's in the business of total transformation. Transformation. And the word became flesh. The word becomes flesh. The word becomes your DNA. What God says about you, sometimes your mind has to catch up with what God is doing in your life. Because God moves at the speed of light and beyond. And your mind is catching up to something that God did in light speed. And you dealing with the old, and God already snatched you out of that and put you in the new, and you still thinking like the old. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. You see, when the Lord comes into your life, he's coming to change you. Let me say that again. When the Lord, anybody say, come Jesus? Anybody asking for more of God? I want more, Lord. Well, get ready for change. Because the closer God gets, the more he deals with stuff that don't look like him. The closer he gets, the more the fire of God begins to come to burn those things off of your life. Because God is in the business of transformation. Total transformation. You see, go, go, I got to show you this. Go to Acts 9. Acts 9. Let's look at verse uh, 10, Acts 9, 10. 
I say freedom. freedom. You feel you, do you feel yourself getting free? Yeah. Man, I've been bonded with these people think about me. The devil is a liar, man. I'm free. I'm free. Okay, in verse number 10, it says, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called straight. That'll preach right there. A straight street. <laughs> Not a crooked street, a straight street. Hmm. Listen, stay on straight, straight street, straight street, call straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Behold, he's praying and have seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered and said, Lord, I have heard many of this man, many things about this man. How much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on your name. And the Lord said unto him, go thy way. Basically, go do what I told you to do. I didn't ask for all that. Don't you know I'm God? Don't you know everything you just said I already know? He thinks he's telling God something he don't know. God already knew who the man was, what the man did. The Lord said unto him, go thy way. Listen to this. For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way. Somebody say transformation. The apostle Paul was transformed. Saul was transformed into Paul on the road to Damascus. Now he had a history of bad things that he did, which of course put a label on his, on, on his life. That even to the point when God is telling one of his disciples to go do something for him, that label begins to pop up. And God said, listen, that guy that you're talking about died on the road to Damascus. This guy now is a chosen vessel that I've chosen before the foundation of the world. Listen, Paul's transformation was so awesome. Later on in Corinthians chapter 7, the Bible says that Paul said, I have wronged no man. That he was so confident in his new identity and disconnected himself from the old opinions. He said, I did not ever wrong any man. His understanding, his, 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 his understanding of who he was in Christ was so strong, he completely disconnected from that past behavior, that past label. God said he's a chosen vessel. And you know if God chooses you, it's a big deal. Paul said what God has done to me is so awesome, I am a dispenser of the same grace that transformed my life. They call him the apostle of grace because so much grace was poured out on his life because of the things that he did, he said, I'm now going to become a dispenser of God's grace, a minister of the grace of God. The one that wrote, now there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm sure the devil probably tried to come to Paul and remind him, you killed all these Christians and now you're up here preaching this gospel, what qualifies you to do that? What Jesus has done in my life qualifies me to do that, and that old guy is dead. I've been risen with the resurrected Lord, and I am a new creature in Christ that has never before existed.
got a new identity. I'm a dispenser now of his grace. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Sorry. Freedom. Nobody's opinion but God. You know, God loves you just the way you are. You know, God made you the way you are. Your behavior, your personality, that's how God made you. First Timothy four and look at verse twelve. First Timothy four, verse twelve. Says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity, till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation. To doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given to thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbyteries. Meditate on these things, and give thyself wholly to them, that thy prophet may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself, and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this, you shall save yourself and them that hear you. Paul told Timothy, let no man despise your youth. I looked up that word despise. It means, listen to this. It means to undervalue, to regard with contempt or distaste. You know, since having this new position, I've had to deal with this. Now, first of all, I look a lot younger than I am. I'm actually older than I look. So right off the bat, people are is the senior pastor here? And then I come walking out. <laughs> you over this whole deal? I'm like, well, Jesus is over. He just put us here to, to run it. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus is the boss. But I, I, I know it's going through their mind like, I mean, how in the world, and what it is, they despising my youth. You ever have somebody try to size you up? Oh, let me take my time through this spot. I, don't, I wrote some stuff down. You see, Paul told Timothy, let no man despise your youth. Years in God does not necessarily mean maturity with God. Let me say that again. Years with the Lord does not necessarily mean you are mature in the Lord. Sometimes I think the thing is on a repeat, and it's just repeating year after year, after year, and there's no spiritual growth. So Paul said, Timothy, I've seen you grow. Now listen, one of my things that I have when somebody tries to size me up like that, they don't understand that I've been in training for the last 18 years. That I didn't just show up and fill out an application. I was an understudy to Bishop Hank Fur. Met with him every morning. Shared insight with me, let me sit on on his meetings, show me how the inner workings of ministry work, how to walk in spiritual discernment, how to know what's of God and what's not of God. That stuff cannot be taught. That stuff must be caught. Thank God for Pastor Ralph and Pastor Diane that they didn't go to some Ivy League school or some seminary looking for the leader of the ministry. That they walk in spiritual discernment and say, God, illuminate 
who's the person because we're not basing this thing on, 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 on abilities. We're basing this thing on who's called to do this because whoever's called has the grace to succeed. So they think I just showed up on the scene. And they don't realize I've been being groomed year after year, walking through. See, let me throw this in. Some of y'all got to enjoy the process and stop focusing so much and getting disgruntled because you didn't reach the destination. The process is all a part of the whole thing. You know, me and my son went to Orlando yesterday, and we were driving. I'm like, I, I know how much time it's going to take to get down there. And he is like... Are we there yet? Are we there yet? I'm like, listen, man, don't ask me that no more. Look out the window and look at the stuff leading up to Disney World. Look out the window. There's some nice stuff along the way. I drove up this highway many times, and I know it's exactly on this highway. In Lakeland, you got a, a Mercedes-Benz dealer and a BMW dealer. Drive a little further, you got this building that looks like a big dinosaur. Just look out the window, enjoy the ride. It's all a part of the trip. Some daddy sun time. And God is saying, our ride is a daddy sun time, and you're so focused on the destination that you're getting disgruntled. And you're making a smooth, a, we're supposed to be a smooth trip, a rough trip. This is supposed to be an enjoyable time, not something that you despise. I know you want to get there, but relax. Tell me about what's going on with you. See, when you have God's anointing on your life, you can do all things through Christ. One man can do the work of five men. God always does more with less. So his power is made strong when we are weak. Some people are not kingdom-minded. They are my kingdom-minded. I don't know what God did to me, just did something in me through my process. I'm not trying to build my own kingdom. I want God's kingdom. My name don't have to be on nothing. You know I ain't even got my business cards done yet. That thing is so far removed from me because that's not my agenda. In the book of 1 Samuel, when God sent his prophet to go looking for the next king, we're almost done, the next king of Israel, he did not send him to the Ivy League school of that day. He didn't send him to West Point. He sent him to a common man who had an uncommon son. But what was uncommon to God was just common to man. Let me say it again. What was uncommon to God was just common to man. God chose one of Jesse's sons to be the next king of Israel. Now, for the sake of time, we won't go. I'll just, I'll just explain it. Anyways, uh, Saul, uh, Samuel comes to the house of Jesse because God tells him the next king of Israel is in the house of Jesse. He said, bring your sons here because there's a king among them. The Bible says that Jesse bought, he had eight sons, but he only bought seven of them up to this ceremony. And it was a no, no, wait, let me count it. No, 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 no. The prophet said, is there anyone else? The father said, this is sad. Father said, you know what? There is one more. David. In the back. The prophet said, bring him. I'm not leaving until I see him. And he brought David forward. And the Lord said, aha, this is the one. 
And the Bible says that the oil was poured on David that day, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily that day. And God had to correct Samuel. Samuel, you look on the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. I look past all the things that you measure. I look at the heart. Don't look at his countenance. Don't look at his stature. I forgot to throw this in on that. When somebody sizes you, I got to throw this in. So when somebody sizes you up, it's all fear-based. It's a manifestation of their own insecurity, so they try to minimize you so they can feel like they got the upper hand on you. Okay. Somebody's trying to size you up. It's all fear-based. They're really insecure in themselves. It's a manifestation of their own insecurity, so they try to minimize you so they can feel better about themselves. God said, I don't size people up. I look at their heart. You know, one of my giftings is I can look at people and see all their issues and insecurities, but I'm still able to see their hearts and have faith that they are going to be everything that God has called them to be. What it does, it gives me a high tolerance that a lot of people don't have. Because I'm looking beyond the issues. I'm looking at the heart. You see, men look at the outside because men put their confidence in the flesh. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Curse are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength. The Bible says, put no confidence in the flesh. Paul listed all his credentials in the book of Philippians. And at the end, he said, I count it all dung for my new identity in Christ Jesus. So the prophet found his king. And the only way David was able to come out on the scene is because they ran out of options. Has anyone ever got a position because they ran out of options? Everybody's gone. You're the only one here. My God, let's give it to him. But don't be upset about it because the Bible says that the first shall be last. And the last shall be first. Don't try to get to the head of the line. Stay in the back of the line. That's all right. The last shall be first. Don't try to promote yourself. It's so much better than when God does it. Sometimes the Lord will allow you to see what is yours being occupied by someone else. And during those times, just keep your cool. Don't take it personal. Just continue to be a good soldier with a good attitude and know that your promotion comes from the Lord. <laughs> they ran out of options. I think the Lord likes that. When you're out of options, then finally you, you'll look to me. David was anointed before he became king. Let me say that again. David was anointed by God to be king before he became king. That means he was a king in God's eyes before men put a title and a crown upon him. <laughs> Let me say that again. It means he was king in God's eyes before men put a title and a crown upon him. And maybe you didn't get the crown yet. Maybe you didn't get the title yet. But heaven is saying, I've already crowned you. I've already gave you the title in heaven. As far as heaven is concerned, earth is just catching up with what heaven has already done. How do you think I was able to sit around here for 18 years and see people get promoted past me left and right and still remain cool, calm, and collective? Because heaven already crowned me, listen, 
two months into the program. God knows who you are before people recognize you. Let me say it again. God knows who you are before people recognize it. Don't get your identity from man. Get your identity from the Lord. Man always has to catch up to what God is doing. Amen? I'm done. Stand up, give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. A new name. Glory. Freedom! Freedom! No more labels. No more opinions of others. Only what God said. Maybe you have, may have did it, but it's not, it's not you. Matter of fact, if you're born again, you didn't do it. Amen? You got a song for me? Let's hear it. We got a song we're going to go out on, guys. Yeah.
You are children of the Most High God. Amen. Amen. Have y'all been blessed? God loves you so much. Amen. What we're going to do is going to dismiss now, but if you need prayer after I dismiss, the prayer team will be up here. Uh, if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we'd encourage you to come when we open up the altars. Amen. Let's lift our hands up to the Lord. Father, we just thank you so much, Father God, right now in the name of Jesus for your word. And Father God, I ask right now that you will seal the word in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirit, in our soul. Father God, I thank you for the healing of the souls of your people, Father God. Wholeness, nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing lacking. Amen? Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us.